What happens when Muslims go to church? Watch closely as we see the Muslims visit the Christians at Aldersgate Methodist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. We're here at the Methodist Church of all places. You may be saying, what's Yusuf doing at a church on Sunday? <laughs> Did he get lost? Well, actually, we've got something very important that we want to do today. We've got a great group that's gathering together here at the Methodist Church in Alexandria, Virginia, to open a dialogue between the Muslims, who are actually worshiping here while we're building our new mosque in uh, Alexandria, and between those who are the Christians that own the property here that have invited us to be together so we can worship here until we complete our project. So let's go in and find out what everybody's got to say about all this. Come join me. Taking time out of your uh, day, out of your holiday to, to come to uh, this gathering. Uh, I'm Steve Larkin, and uh, I thought I'd just take a second to tell you uh, how how I'm I'm here. Uh, as everyone here knows, uh, the Islamic Center has been uh, uh, worshiping uh, in Wesley Hall since last fall, and uh, like uh, like most people at at Aldersgate, uh, when uh, when I saw that, I, I wanted to know uh, a little bit more about the Islamic Center and uh, uh, what I learned is that the Islamic Center has, has really been active in uh, the Alexandria community for a long, long time. And uh, I, I, uh, uh, that, that led me to attend a, a, another meeting. And um, uh, at that meeting, uh, Dennis uh, uh, asked for volunteers to arrange uh, this meeting. And uh, Diane Bechtel, and Diane has uh, been, I don't see her here now, but, uh, okay, Diane and Sally Wiley and Leanne Beach and Gail Richmond uh, and, and uh, yours truly all volunteered to organize this meeting. And the meeting, as we have advertised, is, is a dialogue. This is, we're not trying to draw any conclusions out of this meeting, out of this get-together, other than just to get a little better appreciation of, uh, of uh, our, uh, a part of the Aldersgate uh, community uh, that, that we don't know much about. And uh, hopefully, and we are going to uh, conclude here uh, at about 1.45, hopefully at the end of this session, uh, we will have all uh, uh, finished with a little better appreciation uh, for uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a, a culture, a community uh, that we didn't know very much about. Uh, now, uh, we have asked for questions uh, in, uh, in advance. Uh, this is not to prohibit anybody uh, who's got an individual question, but what we wanted to do, uh, one of the things we thought we'd do originally is go around the room and have everybody introduce themselves. Well, I think obviously that'll take up the whole meeting, and so we're not going to do that. We don't have enough time to do that. Uh, and uh, the purpose of asking for questions in advance is many times uh, questions are very close to the same, and we can consolidate the questions and then make more time for either questions or discussions uh, between now and, and uh, 145. And um, to, uh, to get things started, uh, I, uh, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, somebody who has uh, developed into a, a good friend of uh, Kathy's and, and mine. Uh, what, what we did in preparation uh, uh, for this get-together is we had a little uh, time uh, at our house uh, where in, we invited uh, members of the Islamic Center to come for coffee and, uh, and just to get to know, know them a little bit better. And, and one of the things that developed out of that session uh, was something that we, we thought we really needed to start with. Uh, there were a number of questions that various uh, uh, members of the church uh, 
uh, women in the church had concerning uh, dress or how, how the, the role of women uh, in, in the, Muslim, uh, the Muslim community. And uh, it was really interesting, while we didn't, we didn't have any organized, this wasn't an organized program that Kathy and I put together, we were just having people over for coffee and, and, and to talk. And uh, the thing that really, that really struck us when we, when we, in, when we, the women started to talk is number one, the diversity of uh, Muslim and Muslim women, and it's not something that you really think about at all. There's no reason why we think about it, but it really struck us that way. And the other thing that was interesting was was the personal stories of what it's like to be a Muslim wom woman in, in Northern Virginia. And we've got a ton of things that we can talk about, but we thought we'd start with that. And uh, uh, Lisa Mohammed is in, uh, in, in the back there, and, and poor Lisa is a lawyer and, uh, uh, and therefore has no problem at all about speaking. And Lisa, could could you take this this part of the program and just talk for a little bit about uh, uh, about the experiences that you and and your your sisters have had? Um, I'd like to say I'm very excited to be here today and to be part of this. And hopefully, when uh, at the end of all of this, that we have some understanding of. We have some uh, understanding of commonalities between uh, all of us here. Um, I understand that we have questions, so I have certain uh, ladies in the audience that will uh, answer any questions that you have. Or well, why don't uh, you t start with your background? Okay. I uh, actually uh, was a Methodist. I met a gentleman in uh, 1990. He was Muslim. I converted. Uh, after studying for a while to make sure I felt like it was the right fit for me and so forth, uh, I converted, got married. Uh, as of today, I've been married almost 20 years. It's had its pluses and negatives. Uh, it seems like that um, there's not a lot of understanding uh, about Islam, so uh, there's an enormous amount of judge people being judgmental about things. Uh, my comments always to people is like, well, you don't know enough about it, so you shouldn't judge. Maybe you should pick up, you know, the Quran and read or some uh, get some knowledge of it before, you know, comments are made. Uh, some people are willing to do that. A lot of people, it's just negativity. I mean, I can be in the grocery store with my husband, and, you know, this happened before he left. Some guy tapped on me and was like, well, who's he? And I said, well, that's my husband. He goes, well, why can't you marry your own kind? That's my latest one. You know, and I'm thinking, okay. And I said, well, why would you say that? He was like, well, and then he didn't want to talk about it anymore. And actually, the cashier was really nice because when he came up, she goes, why did you ask that? Why is it in your opinion? I mean, a lot of that goes on. I've been in numerous places. Um, some of it, you know, hey, it's been good. Uh, there's a lot of experiences have been, you know, sad and uh, uh, in school, you know, my daughter went to school here, see me, and there were issues about that, you know, why do you wear that, you know, comments like, you know, foreigner, why don't you go home, I mean, we've experienced a ton of stuff, every time something happens in the community, it's negative, but as long as it affects the aftermath, I'll call my daughter up and say, hey, this just happened, you know, you might be aware, it's just not surprising with some of the, you know, the things that really happen and go on, you know. Go on, so I've picked her and a couple of the other young ladies out over here, and they're going to stand up and tell you a story. I have Emma Tolley here, Yusuf's wife, uh, my daughter, my sister-in-law. You know, they uh, you know came here. They've been part of the uh, you know group, but they've all had you know issues. So I'm going to turn it over, or um, if someone has a question they want to ask, or. I'd like to have an answer from a man on the same subject, a Muslim man. From my perspective in America, men and women are treated, are, are treated equal. And they are equal except biologically, they're different. All my perspective 
world events is Muslim men do not treat women. In fact, and sometimes they treat them brutally. I'd like to know from a man, is this true? And if so, why did you do it? Sam? Somehow I wound up with a microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Yosef, why don't you give a, just before you, first of all, you answer the question, but before you do that, talk a little bit about how you are, where you are. In other words, give a little personal background. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> my name is Yusuf. Can you me, sir? I want to give you a chance to look at all of you. And my name is Yusuf Estes. Can you say Yusuf? Yusuf. Yusuf. No, they said it right. How come you keep saying useless? <laughs> that might be a speech in peppermint. <laughs> Could be. Anyway, we want to thank all of you for inviting us out. It was a chance to be here with you today. And it is a grand opportunity, really, for all of us, as Christians and as Muslims, to come together. And I'm really proud of your church for being open, not just open to allow us to come in and worship, but open-minded to allow us to have a chance to have a discussion like this. One of the things that I work on 24 hours a day is trying to get a true message of what Islam really is to the American people. We recently, and uh, you probably didn't know this, but January 2nd, we officially opened our television channel for Muslims for the United States and Canada. And we've been working on that project ever since almost 20 years. And so we're so happy that we finally got it done. Because, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. The channel, obviously, is for Muslims to learn more about what they're doing and what we're about, but also non-Muslims to come on and be on the channel with us to have these kind of discussions we're having right here. I originally thought it would be great if we could televise this gathering live but uh, it, it, didn't, it wasn't something we could put together that, that fast. But if we could have, it would have been great. Because I know that that's the kind of thing that America needs now more than anything else, is a better understanding. And you don't get understanding just by osmosis. It, it does take some dedication, as our sister reminded us, to read what the book really teaches. But also to sit together and ask questions. And the question that was just presented to us about women it's strange the way you phrased your question because you said, if I'm getting it right, that you had concerns about the treatment of women. You said they were equal, except biological, as far as treatment in America. But then you asked a man to talk about the treatment of the women, and I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> so I got an idea of my place where I live. <laughs> I'm not allowed to speak like that, so I have to turn it over to her. Here you go. <laughs> Let's return to the Muslims visiting the Christians in Aldersgate Methodist Church. Tell us a little something. <laughs> My wife actually uh, has been very supportive of this work that I've been doing for the last 20 years. and it, uh, Without her help and support, I know I couldn't have made it. And I appreciate that. But all Muslims, when we begin any kind of a talk, we're supposed to begin with the name of God. So we say it in Arabic, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And then we praise Him, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, which is like praise God, who is the owner of the universe. <coughs> and after that, we usually give salam. So I'm going to do that right now. It's Shalom, if you know the Hebrew, or Salam in Arabic. And I say, Salaam Alaikum. And then the reply back is similar, Wa Alaikum Salaam. And these guys are getting it down. I don't know, you're educating folks around here about Arabic too much, but that's good. Uh, but one of the things uh, that I think would be nice would be to do a quick inventory. Let's see, how many, how many uh, Muslims do we have here today? Just raise your hands up real high. There you go. Now, how many Christians do we have here today? Huh? <laughs> how do you like sitting with all these terrorists? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Bomb class was last week. 
But seriously, that is the stereotype that we get. When I was raising <coughs> funds for the television station, I kept going to the Muslims again and again and asking them a simple question. What I said was, suppose I take this microphone and I go out to the people and I say to them, finish this sentence for me with a single word. One single word, just finish this sentence. And I walk up to you and I say, finish this sentence. All Muslims are good. Good. <laughs> good answer. Good answer. But what do you think most people really would say? All Muslims are terrorists. <laughs> exactly what they would say. And if you said, what is Islam? What would most people say? What is Islam? Islam is religion. It's a religion. Good answer. But most of the people in the street are going to say what? What do you think they will probably say? Sister, do you know what they will say? Cool. Islam is cool. a cult. Cool. I thought you said cool. I can the book. What? Evil. Yeah, Islam is evil. I heard that one too. So it, it is important to find out what is Islam. If you don't mind me to spend about uh, Four and a half minutes I can tell you, and something will help you to remember next time. Islam is an Arabic word. It's the only word that I found in the Quran that they never translate. All the other words that we have in the Quran, we find them being translated. They, in bad translation, too, by the way, there's a lot of words that they translate, and I say they could have done a lot better than that. But this word, they don't even attempt to translate the word Islam is there. That's how it is. So, I thought about it and I said, let's go to the Maurid or the Arabic dictionary and find out what it really says. And there were five, actually, principal meanings and some sub-meanings as well. It comes from a root in the Arabic language, which is similar to Hebrew, the same root for Shalom, the same root for Saddam, peace, but it has a bigger meaning that you can't say in English, maybe that's why the translators didn't attempt it. Because you need five English words all simultaneously existing to have Islam. And Islam is the noun, Aslama, that is the verb. And it's, all of these are root-driven languages, so they have verbs as the center or the core. The verb Aslama has this meaning, surrender. Now, I said, the Muslims, we're getting pretty good at surrender, you know what I'm saying? Iraq, Afghanistan, <laughs> in airport security. <laughs> so surrender, we got that down. But then another word is submission. And that's one of the most, uh, I think, impressive words out of it because it's a real submission, a total submission. And then is obedience. Islam has the word obedience in it. The fourth word that I found was sincerity. Now I want you to think about this. Sincerity has to be a part and parcel of Islam. If that's true, and that's what the word means, sincerity, it's impossible then to spread Islam by any kind of force or violence. Because you can't force people to be sincere. Immediately, if somebody is going to Islam out of any kind of coercion, forced submission, it's not Islam anymore. So where did this story come about? Islam spread with the sword. Where did that come from? In fact, it makes you start thinking, where did all of this idea come from? Where did we get these notions from? And without delving off into that, let's just continue. The fifth word is peace. But this is not the same kind of peace that we just greeted each other with. This kind of peace is the kind of peace that has to be in the heart while you're doing the other four for your Lord. To surrender, submit, obey, to be sincere, and to be in peace with whatever your Lord gives you after that. That's Islam. If you said, well, I surrendered to God, how come I'm not getting what I want? <laughs> I thought that's what you understood. <laughs> this is so strange, really, for me to stand here in a church today and tell you this, because I learned this in a church when I was a young boy. That's exactly the message that I got from my New Testament of the Bible. In the Lord's Prayer, which is mentioned twice in the Gospel, clearly it says, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Throughout the universe in heaven, God will, His will exists and it, everything 
operates according to his will. Make sense? Well, that's what we believe. It's what the Bible says, what the Quran says. So if you said, well, I want God's will in my life, you just open the door to the word Islam. So it's a whole lot closer, really, to the teachings of Jesus than it is to what some other people are saying out here. So in conclusion, and I did it even faster than I thought. In conclusion, I just want to mention that it's better to take time to, as our sister reminded us, to find out more about it before we make a conclusion about the religion. Joseph asked us, uh, as, as the, uh, the, the moderator here, I must, I must ask you to answer the question. <laughs> it, we, we need to have an answer to the question, and then we'll move on. He wanted it from a man. I got to do it. All right. I tried to pass it off. <laughs> Let's look to what the Quran actually says. And this is a word that I had to, it is a difficult word to translate, by the way. And this is where the crux of the matter comes in. It is from a, a verse in the Quran itself, chapter 4, verse 34 of the Quran. And what it says, it has a lot of things in it. It's a very beautiful verse, actually, because it gives women a status they never had before. 1430 years ago, women were treated like dogs or dirt or less than that. They were, had a horrible condition. There was no respect whatsoever for the women. This is the same century when the Catholic Church convened a council to determine whether or not a woman even had a soul. Yeah, so and we don't need to be on a high horse about this subject anyway. <laughs> the reason is because for the Christians and Jews, it was all about the status of women based on Eve forcing Adam to partake of the tree. Well, we don't have that in Islam. It just says they both ate, period. Nobody blaming anybody else. And both of them repented and they got forgiven. So the story comes out a lot different when you get down the road. There's no blame going backwards. But the verse that I'm referring to in the Quran, it says from the beginning, men are responsible for the women. They must care for them, provide for them, and it is the duty and obligation of every man to take care of every woman. It is not just for your own mother, or your sister, or your daughter, or your wife, but any woman in the community, or even if she's not a Muslim, from this verse it's understood because the word that's used here is not mankind, it's males, regimen, are responsible to take care of the anisa, which is the women. But it continues and lets you understand that because God gave him more power, not over her, but power to go out and work, get a job, make money, come and take care of her. So there is not a need in the Islamic understanding for a woman to go out and get a high education. She can, but she doesn't have to because it's never going to be a situation if everybody follows Islam. This is a big deal. If they follow it, then she won't have that problem of having to take care of herself later down the road. Because they're supposed to take care of her and put her in the situation like a queen. It continues and it goes on to say that because of this, that God has done this for her and for him, that she is devoutly obedient. Now right here, translators put in there that she has to be obedient to her husband, but it doesn't say that. The Sheikh here has memorized the Quran. He recites it for us all the time. Does it say the women have to be obedient to the men or just obedient? So there you are. Now, the where it comes in a problem is when it talks about Nushuzahuna. Now this is an expression here that's often mistranslated. And I went again I went to the dictionary and sat with the people of big knowledge in the language. And they said Nushuza means something that doesn't fit the picture. It's something really bizarre, something like on a flat plane you've got this weird object there. That it doesn't fit. So it means unusual bizarre behavior in general. But specifically, in this case, it refers to something related to uh, sexual connotation. Let's leave it at that. If you observe this on her part, then there are three stages. Because it used to be that men could just, if he, had, if he has a problem with his wife, he could just start beating her. That's what they used to do. Or he could even kill her. And nobody would step up to defend her. So here it says that he can't do that anymore, that he has to tell her, make it clear to her what your problem is, then give her time to adjust to what you're saying. 
It goes on to another level then. After that, leave the bed. Don't share this intimacy with her. Not literally leave as in go out of the house, but you don't share intimacy with her until she wakes up to say...